if you don't have to. Inshallah. So if we can all come closer and kind of make a collective halaqa, the closer we will sit, the more Allah will unite our hearts, inshallah. So I will request all the brothers here, inshallah, and especially from the, also from the sister side, if they also can come closer and sit closer to the window so they can also listen attentively, inshallah. We don't, need, we don't have to, just for the mic. No, no, no buffets. <laughs> so Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Hashim has been visiting. Um, he's been in the Dallas area since Tuesday earlier this week. Um, and he had some programs at the Qalam um, Institute here. And now Alhamdulillah, we were fortunate to have him be with us for, for this weekend. Uh, Sheikh Hashim Ahmed is an American Islamic scholar and teacher holding a degree from Jamia Umm al Qura, Makkah al Mukarrama, with a spe specialization in the science of Quran and Hadith. He also has an MA in Islamic culture from the University of Sindh, Pakistan, as well as Ijaza from many traditional scholars from, where, from whom he studied with. He was deputed in 1985 by Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, Rahimahullah the Chief Mufti of Saudi Arabia as a teacher to Jamiatul Ulum al Islamiya, Bunuria Town, Karachi, and other prim uh, primary Islamic institution. Pre Islam, Sheikh Hashim was a professional musician from, a Los, Ange from Los Angeles, California, where he spent his youth during, the age, uh, during 1960 in pursuit of his musical career, coupled with a passion for natural health, lifestyle inspired from early childhood by his mother, an accomplished nutritionist and a certified organic gardener. He left America in 1970 in pursuit of the original true path of spiritual development and way to the Creator. After extensive travel and search, he accepted Islam in Ethiopia in 1971, then on to Yemen and eventually to Makkah al -Mukarrama. So Alhamdulillah, we are very fortunate to have him. Along with that, he has been teaching the Imam Bukhari Sahih for more than two decades, mashallah. So this is, uh, he's uh, you know, the person who has been uh, given that title of Sheikh al-Hadith is the one that has been given that task to teach Imam Bukhari Sahih. So Alhamdulillah, we are very fortunate to have him. So without any further ado, inshallah, we'll give the mic to him. Jazakallah khair. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidi mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. Subhanaka la ilman la illa ma ahda. Innaka anta la limul hakeem. Subhanaka la fahman la illa ma fahamtana. Innaka anta al jawal al kareem. Wa rabbi zibli amma. Hal minna narud min hamazat al-shayateen. Al-udhika rabbi an yahtharuna. Hal ma'alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na ma'alimtana. Wa zidna bi fadlika wa kalimna ilman wa amala. Ahmabad. So I feel very humbled and blessed actually to be among you and uh, witnessing something that, you know, uh, people like myself who uh, are sort of the early Muslims of this country, we could never imagine to be sitting in a place of this magnanimity with such a crowd of diversity and sheer numbers. I mean, this is absolutely awesome. So. Congratulate yourselves and celebrate and have gratitude that you're all just totally awesome, right? And uh, so it's just it's wonderful. So I just wanted to share that, that, you know, uh, you all take this for granted, of course, you know, because probably many of you came to this community because you have this masjid, you know. Uh, in the early days when I had accepted Islam, we used to eat Fatiha sandwiches. 
finding something halal to eat was not an easy thing to do. You know, you didn't have halal butchers. You didn't even have masjids. So did you ever eat a, a Fatiha sandwich? Malana, did you ever eat a Oh, you're missing out. Because, uh, you know, so number one, we were all poor. We didn't have, any, we didn't have hardly any money. And then there wasn't, it was very difficult to find anything halal to eat. Even bread in those days was difficult because in those days, you know, they used to use lard in most of the baking, you know. And so if you were able to find, you know, halal bread, you know, they didn't have lard in it, that was a great thing. And then so you would just recite Fatiha, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, and then blow in the... And Fatiha sandwich, you see. And so that's how it was. So we had, we had a handful of masajid in this whole country. You know, we had one hafiz of Quran, Qali Maqbul Ilahi, which I was very elated that his great-grandson, sort of, I mean, he was the father of the grandfather of one of our teachers, Mulan Ubaidullah, in, in, in Qalam. So Qali, Qali Maqbul was the one hafiz of this country, you know. And uh, he used to read Tarawih three days in ten cities because he was the only one in the country. So like ten Jews per, per day. And he would start in the night and he would end at the time of suhoor. And it was only people like us, new Muslims, who didn't really, we didn't know Arabic, we didn't know anything, but it was just fantastic, you know. So that's how it was. And now, you know, the, the her father of America, have to play with it. Yeah. Okay. Is, it, is it working now? Can, can the ladies hear? Yeah. They're okay? So, yeah, so that's how it was, you know. And so now, her father of, of America in these, in these kind of cities, it's very difficult for, for them to find a place that they can actually, you know, lead the Tarawih because there's so many, you know, subhanAllah. So, anyway, so it's uh, like my story, people like to hear that. I suppose, the greatest ni'mat that you can have is hidayat, you know. And uh, there's only one dua that is actually wajib on a Muslim to ask. You don't have to ask Allah subhanahu wa for money or fame or name or even, you know, children or sick. But there's one dua that you have to ask for every day in every rakat of salat. You know what that dua is? Ihdinu sirat al-mustaqim. Yeah, exactly to be guided onto the right path, you know, because otherwise, you know, there's subul, there's all kinds of paths all over the place, and they're all leading into ruts, they're all leading, you know, to destruction. And there's only one path that leads to success, you know. So to be on that path is very interesting also that we don't ask, you know, O oh Allah, take us to Jannah. That's not, that's not wajib, that's not the thing. O oh Allah, you know, make us, O oh Allah, Show us the path. Put us on the right path. If we're on the path, we've made it. So, you know, and where we reach on that path, now that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tawfiq. But being on the path, this is the maqsood. You know, Allahu Akbar. So it's a great ni'mah to, to, you know, that, that we're on the path and that we're, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve us and keep us on that path until we reach our destination. So actually, um, I was born in, in a family. I was actually born in Cleveland, Ohio. I wasn't born in Los Angeles. We eventually went there. But I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. My family, they're basically, um, they were basically some of the early industrialists of, of, of this country, actually, my grandfather. And we originally came from Hungary, Hungarian, Jewish Hungarian uh, families who came in the turn of the century, probably my great grandfather and great-grandmother, they, they came to this country. So we came here about the turn of the century. So we're like the fourth generation, you know, like everybody else, you know. So we're, we're worried about immigrants. We're all immigrants. <laughs> everybody in this country except the original people, which are not even really con 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 you know, considered properly, but, you know, we're all immigrants, you know. And actually, we're all travelers, so we're all immigrants into this world, and we're going to leave here very soon, all of us. 
So at any rate, so I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and then I grew up, my, my family actually, they, they were a-religious, in fact, you know, anti-religious, moreover. So I grew up that, you know, with the concept that there's no religion. I mean, the, the ob object of life is to, you know, like everybody else, you know, get an education, get a good job, get money, buy a house, you know, live the American dream. And uh, that's about it. So, however, um, my father was, um, he's still alive, by the way, my mother and father, please make dua for them. They're not, they haven't accepted Islam. They're all in their, they're both in their 90s. And uh, so my father, he was, though he was uh, raised in a business family, but he loved cowboys, you know. So we didn't come to Texas, but we went to Colorado. So we went to Colorado, we bought this big 500 acre ranch in the middle of nowhere out in the mountains and we developed a guest ranch, what's called a dude ranch actually. So it was a resort in, in, in Colorado. It's still there, I, we sold it a long time ago. But So there in Colorado, um, and even as a child, uh, the other thing about our family is, is that we were all musicians. So, like these kids, you know, it, it, it really it touches me, you know, because these young kids, four, five, six years old, they're reading Alif Ba Ta Tha, you know. So I grew up, you know, at four, five, six years old, you know, reading scales and playing, and and, and I used to have to practice long hours, probably longer hours than our Hafiz, you know, spends, uh, you know, studying Quran, you know, but we didn't know any better. So I thought that was my object of life, and since I was a very small child that I'm here on this planet to play music and express myself and so forth. So in Colorado, uh, because that we were out in the middle of nature, you know, out in the mountains and, and, the, and the forests, we had a stream running right through the property and, you know, fishing and hunting and so there, so I was given to pondering. I was actually, as a child, I was very quiet. Not like now, but I used to be very quiet and observant. And so I used to just look at things and just sort of ponder over, you know, particularly nature. I loved to be out in nature. And on our property, there was big mountains. So my favorite thing to do was climb up on top of the mountain and just sit there and just marvel at everything, you know, like the sky and the, mountains, and nature, and you know, I didn't know subhanAllah, or the, otherwise I would have been really been saying that a lot. But I just used to marvel at the, at the creation, you know. And so, around, uh, around 1964, unfortunately my, my mother and father had a lot of issues and ultimately they, you know, went separate paths. So we came with my mother to California, to Los Angeles. And obviously, every musician wants to go to Los Angeles, Hollywood, right? So there I am, this young kid, and actually, uh, already I had been performing in groups as a small, as a child. You know, our family group was actually our, we used to travel around and perform. And then now, around 15 years old, I'm in I'm in Hollywood, and here I go. So I eventually, long story, I, I dropped out of high school, and I, you know, joined various bands and various groups and recordings and so forth and so on. And, uh, but at the same time, this was in the 1960s. Now the 1960s, this was like a turning point in American history. Because before the 1960s, it was like, like I said, you know, everybody was like the American dream, you know? You know, get a job, make money, build a house, you know, and live in the suburbs of America. That's, you know, that's the dream life. But our generation sort of started questioning that. I mean, wait a minute, you know? As a matter of fact, people who are doing that, they don't really seem to be very happy about it. They don't really feel, they're not really satisfied. At the same time, you know, there was the Vietnam War and all these kind of things and, you know, these, these political issues and, you know, why are we doing stuff like that, you know? And uh, so all of those, you know, that movements of the 60s, the hippie movement, the revolutionary ideas, you know, that, you know, why are we bullying the world and all this kind of stuff and, and uh, you know, What's, real, what's the real meaning of life? And then the question of spirituality. Because, you know, this is a material society. It's about materials, right? 
make money, build things, have tangible things. You know, inside, empty. You know, so our generation, some of us, particularly in the arts, artists, musicians, thinkers, you know, academia, people started to question that. You know, so no, there's something more. There's something more real about being a human being. There's something more, you know. And then, as I said before, even though I was kind of raised as an atheist, you know that. But there's a creation, right? There's this huge universe. There's mountains. There's skies. There's universes, you know. And so, and so there has to. It's a creation. So a creation, without a creator, I think it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, a creation without a creator, it doesn't make any sense at all. And so this idea that there is a, there's a force, there's a, there's a creative force in this universe that's creating and he's controlling everything, you know? Whatever, whatever it's to be called, or whatever he is to be called. Or what. So this concept of there's, there's a spirituality and there's a spiritual dimension of the human being and we're starving in that regard. So... People like us, so anything that came to this country in the name of spirituality, I mean, it was like, whatever, we want it, you right? So we had these Hindu gurus coming from India, we had Buddhist monks coming, we had whoever, and actually, so these things were, were coming. Actually, I was at the LA airport, the first big guru from India who came, I was there at the airport to meet him, you know, among other academia and people like that, you know. Or, this is our, our sheikh, you know, this is our, and, and it, because he, he seemed to be something real, he seemed to be something spiritual. Unfortunately, Muslims were nowhere, you know. There was no mention of Islam, you know. There was, there was, Muslims were totally off of, the, uh, off of the horizon. So for the lack of, you know, finding the real thing, so from one thing to the next, yoga, Hinduism, Buddhism, anyism, anything spiritual, you know, we're thirsty, we're hungry, anything. But then ultimately, you know, after the, you know, the initial, you know, trial and error, so no, that's not the whole thing, you know. Just sitting on top of a mountain meditating or something, and then it's okay, what's, what's in it for the rest of the humanity? I mean, how do we solve these major problems that we solve, that we face as human beings? So I came to this conclusion that, because I knew about prophets, you know, you know, basically, that we have these people who came, who claimed to be the messengers of God, and they gave a message. And that message was basically there's a creator, and there's a system of life. And if you live that system of life, you get connected with that creator. And if you're connected, then that's, yani, you made it. The problem is, is that all of these systems claim to be the one, but they all seem to be, have been tampered with, you know, changed, translated, and, and lost in the translation. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of nonsense, you know, uh, uh, sort of merged with, with, with very sort of uh, clear truths, you know. So it appeared to me that since there's a creator, an all-powerful creator, and he's sent these holy people, you know, from time to time. So the real pristine message, the real, you know, unadulterated message must be somewhere. So where might that be? So I, in my whatever little research I did, uh, it seemed that maybe what I'm looking for is in the mountains of Ethiopia. Why the mountains of Ethiopia? Because uh, the last prophet that that, you know, that we knew about or that we, you know, heard about as being a prophet because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, he wasn't discussed. He wasn't even, that wasn't even, that was even on the, uh, on, you know, that wasn't even out there in those days. So they claim in Ethiopia that they have the original teachings of Jesus and with these monks up in the mountains and, you know, being this, this sort of, you know, hippie musician. And so that looks, that sounds very exotic, you know, that sounds really, you know, far out. So I'll go there. So 1970, I just threw in, you know, as we say, throw in the towel in my career. And I said, this is, this is crazy. You know, this, the, 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 the life of show business is just, is just a, such a crazy life anyway. And, you know, the schizophrenia and, 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 and psychotic, you know, mental states. I mean, this is generally what you deal with on a daily basis. You know, most of my colleagues, they never saw 30 years of age. They're all dead either in drug overdose or, you know, suicide or murder or whatever. 
So, 1970, I just left and on my way to Ethiopia. Now, going to Ethiopia, also I was a big fan of Malcolm X. Have you all read Malcolm X's biography? If you haven't, read it, right? So, uh, being a musician, and actually I, I was very involved in the black community because I was, you know, that's the kind of music I played and I was very involved in their, with them and their struggle as well. So I was a big fan of Malcolm X. So whatever he wrote about Muslims, I said, yeah, that, that sounds pretty interesting too. So what I planned to do was to see Muslims also on the way to Ethiopia across North Africa. So uh, I took a plane. In those days, we had these, you know, like these hippie expresses. <laughs> these were like cargo planes with seats, yeah? And it was like $130 you fly from New York City to Luxembourg. And it was just all these hippies in this, in, this, in this plane, you know. So I got to Luxembourg, and then from Luxembourg I went to Paris and, you know, hung out there for a while. And then from Paris I went down through southern France and then went down through Spain. Basically just kind of, you know, I had no timetable, so I just kind of just meandered down the coast of Spain with my pack, and it's kind of like tabligi people, you know, with the pack on the back and all that. So I, already, I was already prepared for that anyway, because that's what I used to do. Uh, even in my music days, I used to just, you know, take a pack and take some natural stuff, like some fruits and some nuts or something, and just go up in the mountains or go out in the desert. You know, in California, we have the San Bernardino Desert. I used to love to just go out there for days and just fast and do meditation, yoga, whatever I knew, and just soak it up and it was just I just loved it you know and then uh, and then I would go up to Big Sur which is a beautiful iconic place and you know where the big mountains meet the 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 sea in northern California so you know that was that was my favorite activity in between as we call gigs you know between you know musical engagements so that's what I used to do so now just kind of like just doing that just going down through Spain and then so finally I reached Morocco so when I got to Morocco it just so happened, it just was the beginning of Ramadan. So when I get into Morocco, the whole country is fasting. Now, I, I used to fast a lot, actually. We used to do water fast, you know, for like for about a week. Just drink water, that's it. And, you know, you really experience a spiritual high, actually. It's, 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 a, it's, it's really... But it's just, it, it's, a, it's a material spirituality, you know? It's like a spirituality which is self-centered. It's not for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but so, uh, so it's, it's, it's important for us to know that there's spirituality and there's spirituality lillah, okay? So you can find people who are very spiritual because they are connected to their spirit, to their ruah, but for their own personal you know, reasons. So this is not the spirituality that we're talking about in Islam. So you've had people that are extremely well disciplined, you know, these yogis and, and others, you know, it's, it's, it, they're, they're really well disciplined but, and they're very spiritual, but it's not spiritual rabbaniya. It's not, you know, it's spiritu spirituality that's really connected to the creator. Anyway, so when I came to Morocco now, the whole country is fasting. They said, yeah, even our king is fasting. I said, yeah, really? <laughs> So this is really, you know, amazing. The whole country is fasting and even the, you know, the king of the country is fasting. Wow. And then you see the social side of it also and the impact of that. Everybody's hungry every day for 30 days. So everybody knows what hunger tastes like, right? Hence, you never see somebody hungry in Morocco. And it's not a rich country, by the way, you know. But that's another thing that I saw. There's, no, there's, no, there's nobody that's hungry in this country. Nobody's dying of starvation here. People are very poor, but everybody's eating. And everybody's giving. Whoever has, they give, you know? It's not like in, in New York City, you know, somebody dropped dead next to you. Hey, well, it's not, my, it's not my headache, you know? So it's like everybody's, like, concerned with one another, you know? Hey, this, is, this is something new, you know? We have this big problem here in America. We're supposed to be so intelligent and intellectual and advanced, but we have this, this concept that somebody has white skin, somebody has brown skin, somebody has black skin, and hey, you know, we have an issue here. That's weird, isn't it? 
the color of your skin makes some kind of difference or something, you know? And then like, you know, if you go in a garden and you see different colors, I mean, is that, is that a problem? Or doesn't that, doesn't that add beauty to the garden, you know? But somehow, you know, shaitan, you know, is, uh, put this. So we have this problem called racism, you know? And we're supposed to be so, you know, whatever. And we've never been able to solve this problem. In Morocco, they, they don't have this, they don't, the concept doesn't exist. I was just telling the, the kids in the, in the Hifsk program, Sheikh Abdul Karim, because he's from Morocco, you know. So I stayed with a family in Isawira, which is, uh, is it's an iconic place in, in, in Morocco. It's, it's, it's such a beautiful place. And so I stayed with this family for quite a while. In fact, I, I loved it there so much, I, it was hard to actually get away from there. So the, the mother, you know, she was like, I, I say, she was like white as snow. I mean, literally, she was pure white. And the father was dark as coal. I mean, he was totally black, you know. And the children were all the colors of the rainbow. I mean, they're all light and dark. It was just fabulous, you know. And you see this very prevalently in Morocco. They don't have any, you know, there's no issue. And I said, wow. So how did they sort that problem out? I mean, I, I understood that. I mean, we're trying to promote that kind of thing here. I mean, you know, racism, what's that? They don't even, the, the thing doesn't exist there. So what is it that, so why does it exist with us and it doesn't exist with them? Poverty, you know, the, the, the difference between the haves and the have-nots, you know? They don't have that there. It's very, it's difficult. It's somebody walking down the street, you can't, in those days, I mean, I, I don't know now, but uh, in those days in Morocco, you walk down the street, you can't really decipher who's, you know, the have and the have not. It's pretty much all the same, you know, not big difference in dress. And, you know, so last year I was in San Francisco. Actually, my, my passport got stolen in Australia. Just fast forward, I mean, this is like last year, so. Just case in point. So I tried to get, when I was back here, I tried to get a, a, a passport online and somehow they jammed it up, they, they wouldn't do it. So they said you have to come down in person, which I was kind of upset about. But Allah SWT actually wanted me to go down there because I haven't been in downtown San Francisco for decades. And I'm like in the middle of the you know the civic center and all of that, it was the most horrific and perhaps one of the most shocking things I've ever seen in my life. What? I'm walking down, I'm looking, observing at trillions of dollars of real estate, and I'm seeing thousands of homeless people on these streets. Thousands. I'm not talking about few. I'm talking about thousands of them. Huh? How many people are from San Francisco? You know what I'm talking about? Now, I'm from California. I mean, San Francisco is my home away from home. I've seen, you know, we have, we have Skid Row in L.A., I mean, but this was horrific. You know, how is it possible that we have such, you know, humongous wealth in this country, we've got people without a place to live? Do they have a thing to eat? This is serious. So in these countries, you know, they don't have this thing. You know, somebody's going to have a place to stay, somebody's going to have something to eat. So I'm wondering, you know, they, What's, you know, is this their culture? This is their religion or, you know, what's the deal? So also in Morocco, so uh, being a musician, so naturally I gravitate to musicians. So I wasn't a Muslim. I didn't really know much about Islam. And unfortunately, you know, the religious people uh, didn't approach me because <laughs> they generally don't approach people like us, you know, the way we were. So I hooked up with, with Moroccan musicians. And these were Moroccan musicians from the village. I was traveling around in the, in the southern, south of Morocco. Anybody from Morocco? Who's from Morocco? Where are you from? From Rabat. Rabat. Have you been to Gulamim, Sirifni, these places? Yeah. So I was actually in Gulamim. And in Gulamim, which is right near, you know, it's on the border going towards Spanish Sahara, Mauritania, and that area. So, so I hooked up with some Moroccan musicians. We met, I don't remember how that happened. And so we used to go from village to village, you know, uh, and uh, playing music and, you know, go to the marketplace and set up and, and play music, go on to the next village. So there in these villages in Morocco, so I used to hear the Adhan. And, you know, the Adhan is not on the loudspeaker, but you have this Muaddin, mashallah, and he's just calling his Adhan. I don't know what he's saying, 
But every time this Adhan, and actually, you know, when, we, when the Adhan is called, we're not supposed to talk. We're supposed to actually pay attention to what he's saying, you know, and say what the Muaddin says, because this is, Ya Allahumma Rabba Hadi Adawa Atama. It is a complete dawat, you know. Allah, Allah. I don't, but I don't know what this guy's saying, but it is, it is really, really heavy. <laughs> it's really, I mean, I, it's just, so every time the Adhan would come, I would just stop and I would just, you know, wow, that's really deep. I don't know what he's saying, but it's, it's got an impact. So my musician buddies, you know, and musicians, you know, are pretty much the same everywhere, you know, <laughs> lifestyle, you know, it's, it's uh, excuse us all, you know, but, but they were Muslims, you know. And so when they saw me, you know, I'm always listening to this Adhan, you know, they don't pray, they don't do anything. but. It's interesting that a Muslim, regardless of his outward condition, you know, the love of Islam is, is there in the heart, you know. And so when they saw me, I'm, I'm, I'm gravitating and I'm, I'm attracted to this Adhan. So they came, they said, look, you're our brother, you know, but we want you to really become our brother and become a Muslim and pledge allegiance to King Hassan, you know. <laughs> so I was really touched by that. I said, oh, that's really wonderful, you know, that it's very kind of you guys, you know. I said, uh, well, as a matter of fact, that's what you know, took me out of America. I'm looking for the real religion, but I, I'm not sure that that's actually Islam. I'm looking, I'm, I'm observing, but I'm, I'm not sure that's really what I'm, I'm after, but I'm, I am some, seeing some. But so anyway, to make a long story short, so they gave me Dawit, even though they have, they have nothing to do with Islam other than being, but that love of Islam is still in the heart. So, you know, take it as a lesson, you know, you know, we might see a Muslim doing whatever, but he's still got that, you know, as we say, a jamra, you know, a flame, a flicker of iman in the heart. That's a very valuable thing. If sort of, you know, pumped a little bit, it can, you know. Anyway, so after a while, um, I decided, no, I'm supposed to be going to Ethiopia. And then so I, I left that group and then I started heading towards Ethiopia. So then I went through Al, Al Jazair, Algeria, and in every place there was things that happened. We don't have a whole lot of time, otherwise I could go on and on and on and on. It was just, just an amazing journey, you know. And uh, I went through Algeria, then uh, Tunis. <laughs> when I came, actually in those days, I don't know how it is. We have anybody from Tunis, Algeria? No? No? So uh, the, if you're going by road, I mean, I, they must be developed by now, but in those days the road, going from Algeria into Tunisia. It was like a car or two a day, you know? So I, I actually, I was walking. I think I got a ride on a, on, a, on a vegetable truck. So riding on top of vegetables, and I think I got to the border. And so, and so I used to, and also I, I really liked the culture of Morocco. I just love that culture. So I had this, and, and one of the, and, uh, and, and these musicians, by the way, they were from Tariq. You know the Tariq? So they used to wear these black imamas. I really loved that, this black imama. So I used to wear that, and I had this big jalabiya from the Sahara, and a souf, you know? So I have this jalabiya, and I have this black imama, and I have my guitar with me, you know? So I come across the border, and then these, the Tunisian border police, I mean, who is this guy, you know? <laughs> and so I said, uh, so just listen. So I played some music for them. They said, oh, yeah, okay, great, you know? And so. And so, uh, you know, I continue my journey and then I go into Libya. When I get to Libya, you know, and I cross the border, I didn't have any problem. When I got to a place called Sirt, anybody from Libya? You know, I like to relate with you. People can, can really relate if they're from those countries. So the place where Qadhafi is from, you know, Mamun Qadhafi is actually originally from Sirt. That's, that's the place. So when I got there to Sirt, so I was sitting in a, uh, in a little, you know, roadside, you know, uh, eating place, you know. And uh, so while I'm eating, two policemen came up and they're standing, you know, behind me. And so they're very polite because they wait, they, whatever they had to do, they were waiting for me to finish my food, you know, so that was very kind of them. Then they said, uh, our chief wants to talk to you. I do, yeah? Okay. So I went with them, and so the, the, the chief of police there, so I said, assalamu alaikum, because I knew, I, I knew a little bit of Arabic, actually. I started picking up Moroccan Arabic, so I was, you know, assalamu alaikum, and alaikum salam. So what do you, 
Where are you from? I'm from the United States. What are you doing with those clothes? I said, what do you mean? I'm a free man. I wear whatever you want. No, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't wear, you have to wear the clothes of your country. I said, oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, he said, and if you don't take those clothes off and put your clothes, you know, American clothes on, we're going to send you back to prison in Tripoli, you know? I said, my God, this guy is, he's pretty weird, you know? So, you know, what am I going to do? I, I said, look, you know what? I don't even have any other clothes. This is like, he said, you better get some because otherwise you're going to go back to, to Tripoli and we're going to put you in jail. I said, oh my God. So what am I going to do? And he said, don't try anything because these guys are going to follow you. So you go and get, 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 you know, you need to look like an American. Okay. <laughs> so I go back to the, to the place where my stuff is, you know, and these guys are following me. So then uh, I pick up my bag, and I pick up my guitar, and then a bus came. So I jump on the bus, and I'm gone. <laughs> now on the bus, this is very interesting, I get on the bus. So the bus goes for a while, then it stops. So somebody got off the bus, and he goes out, and he buys a big basket full of boiled eggs. In North Africa, usually, you know, they, they eat, there's, there's like, you know, dried fruits, and there's like, boiled eggs, and that's how they, you know, they, they can't eat this kind of stuff on the way. So this guy got his, a huge, you know, this, this basket full of eggs, and now he distributes it on the whole bus, and then, you know, says, oh, so we all have boiled eggs. Okay, fine. So the next stop, somebody got down and bought a whole big thing of, I think, almonds or something, and just distributes all of it. So what I understand is that this is a group, you know, this must be some group, and they're traveling, and, you know, they're... Then we, and then Maghreb, around Maghreb time, so we get down, and, and, and every country in North Africa has a thing called couscous. Everybody knows couscous? Morocco has its own, Algeria has its own, Libya has its own. So we all get down, and we eat couscous. And then they're fighting with each other, who's going to pay for everybody? I said, that's pretty weird, you know? <laughs> it's usually like here, it's like they're going to fight who has to pay, right? But here, no, I'm going to pay. No, I'm not. And so they almost got to, you know, got physical, you know? Anyway, so I, these guys are all buddies, you know, and they're all together, a group or something. Okay, we get to Tripoli. No, Benghazi. Yeah, we get to Benghazi. And uh, Benghazi or Tripoli? Wherever it was. Anyway, so we get down, and everybody goes separate ways. Nobody actually knew one another. I said, my God, look at this. You know, Ikram. You know, people ask me, how did you accept Islam? Who gave you Dawit? Nobody gave me Dawit. I mean, speak, speaking Dawit, Kalami Dawit, nobody did. It was all action. It was all sifat. It was all, you know, things that people did, manifestations of the deen, you know. This is ikram, this, you know, this generosity, you know. It was just overwhelming, you know. Um, also in Libya, I was, I forget where I was, somewhere. I think between Benghazi and Trip somewhere. So it was right in the, kind of like in the middle of the desert and there was like some, some olive orchards in that area. So like at Maghreb was coming and I was like, you know, just looking for a ride, hitchhiking or whatever, you know. So by Maghreb, nobody came, there was no ride. So as usual, I was just preparing to, you know, sleep on the roadside. I had my sleeping bag and whatever, you know. So then I see a car coming. And I say, oh, a car is coming. Maybe I'll get a ride. And then, unfortunately, the car turns and starts going down a dirt road. I said, oh. And then it stops. Then it moves back. Then it comes up. And, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the brother in the car says, you know, where are you sleeping? He didn't ask me, who are you? Where did you come from? You know, why are you out here in the middle of nowhere? He said, where are you sleeping tonight? I said, right here. No, 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 you come with me, sit down. You know, he doesn't know me, he had never, you know. So he took me home, he had, they had a little olive farm, they had a little two-room, you know, mud hut, and it was just un unbelievable. Like I was, you know, I met my family that I had been separated from for the past 25 years or something, you know. It was just unbelievable, you know. And so I, I didn't have anything to give them, so I gave them my black turban, which I really loved a lot. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, then he took me to, and, and, and I went on and traveled, you know. 
So, I mean, these are the things that I, that I was seeing. You know, these are, these are people, they have qualities that are just, they're angelic, you know. These, these are, we don't see these things anywhere. So what's, what's giving them these qualities? Okay, well, I get, so I get to uh, Benghazi. So finally I get to Benghazi. And when I get to Benghazi, there was a war between going on, I think, something I was going to skirmish, or between Libya and Egypt. And so they weren't allowing people to go by land. So I actually had to, you know, fly to Cairo. Now the problem was is that it just so happened that it was 12th Rabi al Awal, which, you know, it's generally considered that's the, the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so they take that seriously there, so that was like the national holiday. And so everything was closed. So now I need a I need an exit visa to leave the country so I can fly to Egypt because I have a flight like that day or that night or something like that. So I went to the office and it's all closed, you know. It's, what's going on here? So the janitor, you know, the guy that's, you know, kind of you know, looking at the caretaker or whatever, so he sees me and says, you know, what's your story? So I said, look, you know, I'm going to Egypt. I need to get this, you know, exit visa. He said, it's closed. Everything closed. It's Prophet's birthday, you know. Nothing happening today. I said, you know, I've got, I, what am I going to do? I have to get on this flight. So he just said, oh, oh, okay, wait a minute, just hang on. So he went, and then after a while he came back, and he opened up the door, he took out the stamp and all that thing, and just did it. <laughs> I said, mashallah, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, so, I mean, so again, here's this, you know, he doesn't know me, he doesn't have to do anything for me, but just out of kindness and just concern, human concern, I mean, the guy just really goes out of his way to do that. Probably could have gotten in a lot of trouble, I imagine. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. So, so then I get to Egypt. Now in Egypt, so I went right to Cairo. Anybody who's from Egypt? No Egyptians here? Come on. Yeah? Min Fain. Min Nafs al Qahira. So you know the opera in downtown Qahira? That's where I was. That was probably the noisiest place I've ever seen in my life. Isn't it like that? It's so noisy, I had a headache constant. I couldn't, I had to actually leave because I had such a big headache. Now anyway, there was this little, they called pension, right? You know, these real cheap hotels. It's like about 50 cents a night or something like that. And so, um, so I, I took this room there and there was, you know, there was, there, was, there was this kind of mystical kind of a guy that was, he was like some type of, you know, serving people there, doing something. And so he used to sit back and just look at me, you know, studying me. And he had, you know, like this uh, fez, and he had this, you know, or hizam, you know, very interesting guy, you know. And he's just watching me. So then he came over to me and he started, you know, he started, you know, dictating some stuff. He say this. And I realized later that actually he was, he was teaching me Surah Fatiha. You know, I just, <laughs> just like... So I don't know what he's telling me, but he's telling me, read this and read that. And so I'm saying, okay, okay, okay. Okay. So now from Egypt, from Egypt I have, I have to go to Sudan. I'm going to Ethiopia. So what I do is I go down the River Nile, you know, go down through all through the south of Aswan and through all that. Then I come to, to Lake Buhaira, Buhaira Nasir, which is this huge lake. It's a man-made lake, actually. It's a dam, and it's like a three-day journey or something like that. We had this old boat. You know this? Did you ever read the Mark Twain, you know, Huckleberry Finn kind of thing with the, on the Mississippi River boats with the paddle wheel on the back? So that's actually the kind of boat they had, you know? So it had, it, it had this boat. Um, and there's another thing interesting. Before that, actually, when I, in Cairo, so when I want to go to Sudan, so I have to have a, a visa. So, how many people do we have from Sudan? Do we have anybody from Sudan? Who's from Sudan? No? So, anyway, so I went to the Sudanese embassy, and I, I, you know, I'm dressed up, you know, with all this, because I, that's the clothes I have. I really like those clothes. Because actually I was fed up with America. I didn't want to see anything American, so I just loved that culture and all that. So I had these, you know, I probably it was Tunisian clothes or something like that. So anyway, so when I came in the, in the, in the, uh, into the embassy, so, you know, I said, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam. He said, are you Muslim? I said, yeah. <laughs> I thought that probably, you know, I kind of thought, you know, 
I'm kind of like I am because I mean I'm so impressed with these people. I really like them. I really identify with them. They said, "So do you know this kalima? La ilaha illallah. La il and since I'm a musician, so we pick up anything we hear, you know. So he just said the kalima. Do you know this kalima? La ilaha. I said, yeah, yeah. La ilaha illallah. Yeah, la ilaha illallah. Muhammad Muhammad Rasul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that. Okay, okay. <laughs> Stamp. Go ahead. Okay, great. So now." So I'm going down, you know, down the Nile, and then finally we get to Aswan, and then Aswan, we get on this boat. And there was another Afro-American brother, he was a bass player, so we were both jazz musicians, right? So we hooked up. Now he thought that his roots were in Ethiopia, so he was going to Ethiopia for that, and I was going to, you know, join these Coptic monks. So we were traveling together. So we got on that boat, and on that boat, there were Sudani camel traders. I mean, these guys are like from the Badia. They're from, you know, the, the desert. And what they used to do was they used to take their camels up to Egypt and sell those camels and they would come back to Sudan. So they were on the boat. And while they were on the boat, they used to call the Adhan and they used to offer their Salat in Jamaat. Now I have never seen actually the Muslims praying in Jamaat and I haven't really seen that firsthand because in North Africa, you know, if you're not a Muslim, you don't go into the masjid and actually in the Maliki Madhab, they don't allow that and there's Imam Malik Rahmah is pretty solid proof for that. Others may not agree, but anyway, so that's how it is there. So you don't go inside a masjid. I always wanted to do that and see how the Muslims pray, and I always wanted to go in the masjid, but I never had that opportunity. So now I'm getting it, you know, firsthand. Now these, so this fellow, again, that azan, so you, you already know azan, how I'm with azan. I'm just, you know, like, wow, you know. And then these guys, and, and this is something interesting. You know, all of you, you know, when you see people praying, does, is anything special? I mean, does that seem like anything, you know, amazing or awe-inspiring? Adi, right? Because you've seen it from day one. But for somebody who has never seen this Salat before, it is mind-blowing, I'm telling you. So I'm sitting there on this boat, and I've never seen this, you see. And... So now you have this imam, and then you have these, these and, and imagine, we're in the middle of the desert, and these are Bedouins, you know, they're probably illiterate. They are not, I have seen discipline in this line of, of worshipers. You wouldn't find that in a military. Perfect. Not only that, Allah Akbar. All their eyes are riveted to the place of sajda, you know, they're just, and I'm just looking at this. Wow. And they're just totally silent, totally concentrated. And then, Allah Akbar. And then like one body, they just, you know, rukur. And I said, wow. You know? I don't know if any of you have gone to like churches or synagogues or any of these kind of places. There's nothing like this. There's nothing that even comes close to this, you know. So now... Then, Samya Allah, Huli Man Hamid, then again. And I'm just, mind, I'm just, my mind is just boggling. So then, Allah Akbar, then when they all, you know, made sajda, I just said, that, that's it. That's it. That is the epitome of Urbudiya. I mean, I didn't know the word Urbudiya, but I mean, if that's what, you know, that's the essence. Whatever religion that is in, that's what it is. And I knew it's, it's, Muslim, it's Islam. So from that moment, I understood that Islam, that's what I was looking for. However, I've come all this way to, you know, to hook up with these Coptic monks. So what do I do? Anyway, I'll tell you a little story about Sajda, by the way, just you know, while we're on that topic. Um, fast forward around 1973. So, who's from New York? Anybody from Brooklyn? New York City? So we have in New York City, we have a State Street Masjid. One of our very early Muslim brothers, Sheikh Daoud, he was from Jamaica actually, and he passed away a long time ago. But he used to be there, and, his, and Sister Khadija, his wife, you know. And so anyway, we were in that masjid, a group of us, um, you know, new Muslims, Americans, you know, so. So in the middle of the night, and it's kind, of, it's kind of a rough neighborhood, so in the middle of the night, somebody comes banging on the door. So in the middle of the night, somebody banging on the door, like, okay, you know, <laughs> get ready, what's this, you know? 
And uh, so, yeah, who's this? He said, let me in, I want to become a Muslim. He, okay, yeah. So, so it's this Puerto Rican brother from Lower East, you know, Lower East Side of Manhattan, which is an extremely dangerous area, right? So this guy comes in and he says, okay. And then he tells us his story. He said, okay, uh, like, you know, what happened to me is like I was, you know, I had a good job. In fact, I had two jobs. I was working, I was earning good money, I had a wife, I had kids, and everything was, was great. And then somehow, you know, I got, you know, started messing with heroin, and I became an addict, lost a job, lost a second job, my wife left, my children left, and that was like eight years ago. So I'm like eight years a heroin addict, and it's just like I tried to get off, but there's no way. And getting off of heroin is like, you know, uh, it's, it's next to impossible. It's very rare that people actually, you know, break that. So anyway, so he went through rehab, you know, different types of programs, but nothing worked. And so like his life is, you know, it's, it's, it's done, it's finished. And then somewhere, he said, I saw in a picture, I saw this picture of somebody in sajda. He didn't know the word sajda, in prostration, you know, like a Muslim in prostration. And he said, if God will listen to anybody, he's going to listen to this guy with his face on the ground in total humility. So what did he do? He doesn't, now, he doesn't know anything about Islam. He doesn't know Salat. He doesn't know La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So he spent the whole night in sajda, this guy. His name is Yusuf, he accepted Islam on the spot later. So he said the whole night he stayed in sajda for hours and he was just crying, oh God, help me, help me. And he said until the sun came up. Has any of us done anything like that? And we're Muslims, you know? And he said when, when the sun, when, the, when, you know, daylight, you know, sort of, you know, you know, came up and then, so then he said, I, 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 you know, I lifted my head and I don't want to hear about, I don't want to see heroin anymore. Bus. Cured. You know? So, so he said, yeah, so then if that part of, you know, and then he realized that that was a Muslim and that that was something in Islam. So, so now he's roaming, he said, I've been looking all day long. And as I said, it's not like you just, you know, Google, you know, Islamic Center, your local masjid or something like that. We're talking about 1973. You had like about three or four places in the whole city of New York that you might find open or not. And Fajr, forget about it. You know, it might open at nine o'clock, you know. <laughs> And so he's looking all over the city for some for Muslims, right? And so finally, in the middle of the night, he finds us. So then he reaches into his pockets. He says, look, this is all I have in this world. Just take it and just take me with you guys. You know? That's how Islam started in this country, by the way. Okay. Anyway, so that's about such stuff. So let's go back, go back to the, the story. So now I've seen these, 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 these guys making salat. So I'm like, yeah, this is it. Okay, anyway, it's Sudan, and then a lot of things happen in Sudan, and finally I get to Ethiopia. And now the interesting thing is, and, and so many interesting things happen, but we don't have time. So in Ethiopia, the very interesting thing was actually I did go to these, these, these Coptic monks, you know, and, and you know, if, if you understand the word Zuhud, you know, uh, you know, the abstinence of the world and all the world, I mean, they had nothing to do with the world, period. I mean, it was just worship and fasting, and they would just eat, you know, plants that they found growing in the, in the ground. I mean, that's, and even they had beards and they had turbans and they kind of actually looked like Muslims. But you know what? What I observed was they didn't have any light in their faces. They didn't have any nur, you know? So it all looked, you know, they looked pretty, you know, they looked pretty, you know, for real. You know, these guys are really, you know, dedicated. They're really cut off of the world. They're really, you know, focused on their, you know, their worship and all. But they, they don't have any light in their continence. So, you know, musicians, artists, you know, we kind of go by what we call wujdan, you know. <laughs> Feelings, you know, if it feels right, you know, it's okay. If it feels wrong, we don't buy into it. So these people, there's something wrong, something missing. Now, a Muslim, 
who's like a good Muslim, he does zikr, he offers prayers, he's maybe he's got a little shop, you know, but he, he, you see him even in his shop, he's a shopkeeper, but he's got light on his face, he's got nur. So the, the religion that is right, it produces light, it doesn't produce darkness, right? Anyway, so things like this, so I'm, okay, okay, I got it, I'm supposed to be a Muslim. So nobody actually said, you know, this is Islam, this is what Allah says, this is what the Hadith says. Nobody. I never hear, heard anything. No ayat of Quran, no Hadith, nothing. Just seeing these various things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was just so kind and then said, you know, okay, I want to be Muslim. Okay, I want to be Muslim. So what I do, I go down in the middle of the city of Alisa Baba. We have anybody from Ethiopia? No Ethiopians? What happened? I thought this was supposed to be a very diverse crowd, you know. Anyway, so in the middle of Addis Ababa, there's a place called Mercado, which basically means, you know, the market, you know, and usually Muslims are always, you know, we're always downtrodden wherever we are. But this was during the time of Haile Selassie also, who was the king of Ethiopia, and he wasn't really favoring Muslims at all. <laughs> As a matter of fact, yeah, Muslims are having a pretty hard time. So I went down there. So, because that's where Muslims are mostly, so there's a big mosque down there. So I got this little room for about 50 cents a day. And so I want to learn about Islam now. I want to learn how to pray and, and be a Muslim, because I'm a Muslim now. <laughs> and, and no, you know, no shahada, no anything, but I just want to be a Muslim. Okay, so I get down to this and I meet some young Ethiopians and, okay, I, I want to be a Muslim, I'm a Muslim now, and I want to pray. So can you teach me how to pray? So, well, I don't really know how, but let's go to so-and-so. So, we went, well, I don't know either, really. So, what do you do? Okay, just go to the mosque and just see what they do and just, you know, do what they do. Is that okay? Now, Ethiopia, by the way, is not like uh, a tourist country, right? It's not a place like where people generally go. And so, they don't see people like me. So, I obviously don't look like an Ethiopian. So here's, here I am, I'm in the, in the mud, so in the, and it so, so happened, it was like Juma. It was Juma Salat, it was my first Salat in Islam. So I entered into the masjid, and it was packed, so right in the back, so then, you know, it was, there was khutbah was going on, then time for Salat, so then I don't know what's going on, I don't know what to do, and then they stand up, and then they, so I'm just, you know, watching people, hello, hello, you know, <laughs> Raku, okay, and then, Sajda and just do what they do, you know, mashallah, it's great, I love it, you know. And then uh, after I finish that, then I come out and I see, you know, people are offering sunnah and nawafal. I said, I guess I should do that too, but I don't really know how to do it right, you know. And I didn't remember the whole sequence or something, so I, I messed up somehow or another. So I think people kind of said, hey, wait a minute, this guy looks like he's, you know, suspicious, you know. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm like trying to make my salat, and these people all start giving. <laughs> I said, oh my God, my first salat, my last one, you know. <laughs> and then, subhanAllah, I, I, I have no idea what happened. Somebody came, you know, it's like in Surah Yasin, Rajman This is exactly what somebody came. <laughs> okay, and everybody left. Alhamdulillah, you know. So then, uh, so then, alhamdulillah, so I, actually there was in that place where I was living, there was some Nigerian sheikh, you know, actually. so he started teaching me stuff, and so I started learning. Then Ramadan came, so I went to a place called Harar, which is you know, just an amazing place. That's a place for ulama and deen. So that's the first, you know, I first started really practicing Islam. And then, uh, and it was amazing in Ethiopia, you know, they, subhanAllah, in Ramadan, all night in Ethiopia in Harar, they used to read Quran. That, that what they would make halakas. They would read Quran all night long. Then after Fajr, around after Shuruq, they didn't go to sleep. They used to go to their jobs, go to their unbelievable, you know. And I just watch these people and just marvel. Where are they getting this energy, you know? Anyway, so I had a lot of problems in Ethiopia with the authority because they couldn't figure out what I was doing there. So everybody, they thought I was a spy or something. And, you know, they kept on, you know, the intelligence people kept on bothering me. Every day they'd haul me in, question me. So then our brother said, okay, go to Yemen because that's a place where people can help you. So I went to Yemen. And mashallah in Yemen, you know, I could go on and on about Yemen. It was just, a, it's, just it's so painful what has happened now to Yemen. 
you know, and our Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, what he says, al-iman yamanin wal hikma yamaniya. Do we have anybody from Yemen? From Yemen, where? Have you been there? From Hadramut. Actually, I wasn't able to go. In that time, it was, you know, that was the uh, Yemen, uh, Junubia was Shimalia, you know, Shiria and all that, and there was two countries, actually. So I couldn't go, I couldn't go to Hadramut, but I was in Tez and Sana'a. And... So I have a lot of stories about that. We don't have time. Anyway, so then from Yemen, um, so I went for Hajj. I'll just share one th amazing thing in Yemen that happened to me. Um, so when I wanted to go for Hajj, actually I, I had no idea about going for Hajj. But I'm a new Muslim. I thought that's something you do, you know, like after you're really, you know, you really have your act together and you really, you know, have reached some level of whatever. So, but ulama there, they said, we're going for Hajj, you come with us. I said, oh, how can I go? No, no, you come with us. So I had to go to Sana'a to get, you know, a visa. And my passport was like the old Hashim, you know, <laughs> pre-Islam Hashim, which didn't look like he does now. And the name wasn't the same and all that. And actually the name was given to me in Morocco. This, this name, uh, Hash, it was originally Hisham. Then in Yemen they said, don't make it Hashim. That was the grandfather. So that's, so that's how that happened. Okay, so I went there. So when I went to the, the Saudi Yemen, they said, okay, but we need, we need a Shahada that you're actually a Muslim and that you're for real and all that. You could look at your passport and all that. So I said, okay, so what do we do? You have to go to the Majlis al-Qaba al al-A'la in Sana'a. So I went to the Majlis al-Qadawal, there was one of our ulama mashayikh of, 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 of uh, Yemen, so he took me over there. And you know, all these, you know, the kibar ulama with their jubbas and their big imamas and all these guys, like 70, 80 years old, about 10, 12 of them. And mashallah, they were just, you know, subhanAllah, Rabbani, you know, you know, ashab al haiba you know. So they sit me down and they have this, this big table and they're all standing around looking at me, you know. And they start asking me questions, you know, like, you know, how did you accept Islam? What happened? What was your story? This and that. I don't remember exactly what all. So I'm answering the best I can. And then so they say, do you know anything of Quran? So I said a little bit. You know, they said, do you know Fatiha al-Kitab? I said, yeah, I know Fatiha. Can you read that? So I read Fatiha. And all of those mashayikh just started to weep, you know. And it was just such a, you know, moving experience. And so they wrote, I still have that to this day. In fact, I have a picture of, of me from them, you know. I was like 21 years, 20 years old, you know. And uh, so handwritten, you know, from the Majlis al-Alam and the Qadi and the Akbar al Yemen. And they wrote that thing, and so they got, I, got, uh, I got the visa. And then, so in those days, we went to Hajj on the boat. So from Hudayda to, um, to Jeddah, so it was like about a three-day journey on the boat, and I was really sick. And actually, I had an abscess in my liver that I didn't know about. And so when I got to Saudi Arabia, I was delirious, and, and they had to actually carry me off the boat, and then ultimately, <coughs> a friend of one of a friend of my my friend in Yemen. So his you know his very close friend was a doctor in Jeddah, and so luckily they carried me over to the doctor, and so the next day I was okay. It was Yuma I went through Hajj and all that. Then I came down with pneumonia and hepatitis, and I had this abscess in the liver, and I fell off the bed in the hospital and that cavity broke, and then this fluid went into my lung cavity, the lung collapsed, and so it was like six months in the hospital. <laughs> and so I actually never wanted to come back to America, but um, so I had to actually come back for the, this operation. So I came back to America, I studied Arabic for a, for a year in, in Los Angeles City College, 1972, you know? There was, there was nothing there, I mean, that's why you've got this madrasa, you've got all of this stuff, you got, just to learn Arabic, we have to go to, you know, find some program and non-Muslims are teaching it, you know. And so then on my way back to Medina, actually I wanted to go to Medina. In those days, Shikman Baz was the rector of Medina Monroe. In, in Medina Monroe, he was the rector of the Jamia. So, you know, so he had told me that, you know, just, you know, you have to change your visa and then come back. So anyway, so I came back, I was on my way back to Medina. I stopped in New York just to, you know, see a friend of mine a brother who I met in Medina who was also a new Muslim. So then, so then in, this was 1973, so then in New York I ran into Tablighi people, you know. And so then they, they said, where have you guys been, you know. So, so I joined them and I went around, you know, here in, in, for four months we went around here in the United States, actually in the East Coast. 
And I wish I had another two, three hours to tell you how things were in Islam in those days. It was just amazing. Anyway, and then I went to India, I came back, and then got married, and then ultimately went off to Mecca. And then a lot we can talk about there, but time is over. So then from there, I was sent to Pakistan. I've been there for the past 35 years. And now, you know, we have a saying in, in, in Arabic, in Ikulun Yerja ila Asli. So now um, I find myself, you know, pretty much coming back here, and I'm more gravitating towards America, and I'll probably I'll be more centered over here for whatever I have left of my life. So, Jazakum Lakhir. That's kind of a khulasa tul khulasa, as they say. <laughs> Hopefully, inshallah, this will be a, actually just if for nothing else, you know. My kids should know something about their legacy, how they happen to, you know, be Muslims. So hopefully it'll be a book one day. So tomorrow um, we have a very, I think it's a very interesting program and I, hopefully it'll be a very beneficial program for me. At least I, I get benefit from it. And we're going to be talking about, as Muslims, how do we have a holistically healthy, meaningful life? which is what we're supposed to be, hayat and tayyibah. So we're going to look into that uh, a little bit more detail. There's going to be some exercises. There's going to be some, you know, it, it'll, it'll be interesting. I think, I think you'll really like it. So please join us tomorrow, inshallah. Looking forward to have you. Jazakum la kulli khair. Barakallahu feekum. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdikam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh, for the inspirational talk, inshallah. Um, we will request everyone to, inshallah, join us tomorrow after Zuhar. Shaykh will be giving a, a workshop on the holistic lifestyle. It's something very important for us to learn, inshallah.